I just couldn't see myself being happy if I turned the music option down. I, I just couldn't, I, I don't know what I would be regretting in my entire life, I think. Success has a different meaning for everyone, and it's not always easy to define. Our guest this week is Slade Echeverria, one of the founding members and current manager of the rock band Ann Arbor. Slade and the band saw success early, getting a record deal when they were still in their teens. But if you ask Slade, the real success didn't come until later. Much later. Ann Arbor has a dedicated fan base and have had commercial placements on TV programs like SportsCenter and Cartoon Network. But is that enough? Slade explains what his marker for success truly was on this episode of The Big Break. Hey Slade, how how are you doing today? I am good. I am good. Enjoying this Friday uh, quarantine day, even though every day, every day almost seems like a Friday now. It's like a quarantine Friday. <laughs> Actually, you know, they all seem like like Wednesday afternoons to me, which is not a good thing at all. <laughs> not it's good. The, it's the worst time. It's always like you know, what day is it? It's what, how much do I have to get done? You know, that kind of thing. Where where are you hold up in right now? So I am in uh, downtown Phoenix uh, with my lady and a two year old. Oh, okay. I hope that's going uh, well, giving you guys some time to connect at least. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Almost too much time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So listen, yeah, I just, uh, you know, this is an, you're in an interesting spot. You're one of the few people that I talk to that um, does, you know, you're both, uh, you know, you saw, you write your, your, your own music and whatnot, but you also perform and you record and things like that. And, yeah. you know, just uh, usually I start off with, uh, we go, we jump right to the early days, but I kind of want to talk about the current situation for a second. So you're yeah, trying yeah. to get a sense of how you're, you know how you're currently coping, I guess, with um, with the shutdown of you know you know live uh, performances and, and whatnot. Yeah, you know it's really interesting to see everything just kind of shut down. Literally, about six months ago, I had planned to hit overseas with Ann Arbor, and we were going to hit for the first time, literally, of being a band for like 17 years. We were going to hit the UK, you know, Germany, a little bit of Europe, a little bit of here there, um, for about three weeks. Even hit Glastonbury, which is going to be like one of our biggest. Um, moments as a band, but this whole corona, coronavirus thing just to shut everything down. Um, so basically, what me and my other bandmate have been doing is he's coming up with some good ideas when it comes to streaming, just you know old records, new records, whatever we've got kind of in our discography. But streaming is huge right now, and I think that's everybody's just kind of sitting at home. So that's that's kind of what we've been leaning towards is just the streaming getting kids you know trying to get them involved any way that they can to watch us play our music and you know it's almost like a free concert for them so that's what so that's this, what is this a is this like a live stream concert or are you guys doing like like listening parties of recorded music or both um so basically what we're doing is like a live stream type thing um of us just playing live so we made separate tracks not not uh, separate from the original tracks kind of just to spice it up a little bit you know i feel like it's super boring when people are just playing with an acoustic um guitar unless you're like you know usher or somebody crazy somebody awesome you know singing that you're like well known for but when it comes to bands it's like so easy for us to spice things up nowadays so we made like separate tracks to like more r&b style a bit more broken down um we plugged our computer in and then we have like an electric guitar that we're playing around with while i'm singing the actual song so just kind of keeps it interesting for the kids, you know, and for us too, man, <laughs> for us too. Yeah. I'm not, and you, and you guys, um, are you in different locations while you're streaming this? Um, so right now we are in the same location that okay. might have to change here shortly just because of everything that's going on, but we are keeping a safe distance between each other at the moment. <laughs> okay. No, cool. No, I just, I'm just curious. I mean, there's yeah, so many no, different ways you could slice this, you know, and yeah. I think it's really, I've found it, well, it, you know, it's very difficult for so many artists and, and obviously there, there's a lot, you know, to kind of take in here, but the, the, the creativity and a lot of the innovation that we're seeing right now with people just trying to find new ways to, to not just create music, but just to you know, perform and engage with, with the fans. I mean, there, there's so many levels to what it is, I think, you know, to be an artist that you got to think through all of those. And, and I, I don't, I don't envy the position you're in, but uh, I, I'm certainly impressed by your response to it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's crazy. You know, I had a crazy question that a kid asked me as we were streaming. He was like, what's the difference between now and, you know, when you first started? And it's like, you know, back in the day when I first started, I, I was in a garage. There was no, like, computer garage band. None of that stuff existed. You know, I was making music in a garage, and then we thought it sounded good. 
So we played a show and then after that, maybe we try to hit California. Like now it doesn't even matter where you are. You can bust open your laptop, jump on GarageBand, make a song in an hour and then put it online and kids can hear it and listen to it and stream it and, you know, do whatever they do, which is just, it's just insanity when it's all coming down to. So there's, really a- no, there's like no answer, I feel like, to, to any of it. Nobody really knows. <laughs> right. And it doesn't have to be just one way either, which is always, I mean, that's always been the case, no matter what situation. There's never really just one way for it to, to work, which is why we, this is why I particularly like doing this podcast is that, you know, when I talk with folks about how they got started and how they came up, every story is different. You think it might be, you think it might not be, but it literally is every story is totally different. So yeah, that, pay, that totally makes sense. Yeah, for sure. So let's, let, maybe we can get into that then. Like, uh, let's yeah. kind of get in the way back machine here a bit. Um, you know, how did you, how did you get into music in general? Not, not even as a performer or a professional or anything like that, just like yeah. what, what, you know, the, the, the time where, where, when you heard music or when you were, pre, you know, got into music that somehow that was different than the way maybe other people hear or get into music. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know if it's anything crazy. Literally my, my parents are huge eighties freaks. They love eighties pop music. And even since I was a little kid, like my earliest memory, was like listening to Cindy Lauper or Aha in the car while my dad's just like busting it out, you know. Um, I think that was probably my biggest influence as a child. Just my parents literally look jamming to to almost every type of genre. So my dad was a cowboy. He literally is a literal cowboy. He's got farms, got all this land, and I grew up on the farm with him a lot. He listened to a lot of country music and um, in the car we'd drive to like New Mexico to pick up new livestock, and I'd always be in the car with him and. Um, I think one of the most memorable moments I guess I ever have now that I think about it is driving to New Mexico with him and listening to um, ELO. Uh, what's the song called? Uh, t- I think it's called Telephone Line. It's in that. Um, <laughs> it's in that. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, that Adam Sandler movie. Um, anyways, my mom. We called my mom because we all missed her. Just him and my dad, and we sang that whole like first part. Hello, how are you? The whole thing. She has it still on a. Uh, on Messenger, and we still talk about it to this day, which is really funny. But I think that's probably what it influenced me to be a singer. Um, my mom, back when I, I guess, I guess earlier back when I, uh, let's see, probably around fourth grade, so what I was probably like six or seven or eight, my mom took account of herself to put me into singing lessons because I was singing around the house all the time. She's like, "You need to stop singing. You know, this is this is getting annoying." And I was like, "I don't know why I sing. I don't know why I'm doing this." She's like, I'm going to put you into singing lessons. And I was like, this is for, for girls. You know, I never really wanted to do it, but I didn't really have a choice. So I did singing lessons for about four years and I sang at malls and I sang at, you know, honestly, wherever they could, they could put anybody to sing. It was pretty embarrassing sometimes, like old, <laughs> old, like old, old people homes. And, you know, it was, we, we literally hit like everything, man, state fairs. Um, that basically got me prepared for like, just just getting into the music thing. So that, it, that kind of all influenced me to just kind of join a band, I think. That's interesting. Now, was this the music school where you were taking the lessons, doing the, you know, getting you placed at these places to perform? Um, so basically my mom was like, how do we do this? What am I going to do? She just looked in the newspaper and there's this lady called Gloria Rich. And she had, she was just having lessons from her house and it was like a hundred bucks a lesson for like an hour and a half. And I did that for a while. And she was the one that, um, you know, pushed for all the live performances. So she would sign us all up for these and, Hey, if you want to do this, do, you know, sign up here. And I was always as a kid, like, yeah, I want to do that for some strange reason. Yeah. It kind of suited me up for everything that I, that I guess was going to be doing. That's cool. That's cool. So I guess, cause that's, that's interesting because I mean, I, I always ask this, there's a lot of folks out there like myself and others who, you know, like music, appreciate music. And, 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 you know, for some, it's even a big deal, like, you know, get into collecting and all these other kind of things, but there's usually something else that, that will get someone like yourself to take that next step to actually creating and performing the music. And I'm always really fascinated by that because that's a different, right. It's it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an expanded uh, appreciation, I think of it. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I was, I took lessons and at that time I hadn't really gotten to the artistic side of anything. Like I didn't get a guitar or anything. I wasn't taking piano lessons. I was just strictly taking voice lessons. Um, and you know, it's weird. I wasn't interested in playing the piano. I, for some reason I wasn't really into it. I had friends that had done it, but I was like, I don't want to play piano. I want to play guitar. So I think, I mean, when I was around nine, my parents got me a guitar. Um, and I just dibble dabbled on that. I, I was more singing with with my lessons rather than like creating 
and being an artist with it. Um, right around until I got into high school and I had my first girlfriend, honestly, um, she was just, yeah, it just, you know, how, how the, the sorrows go when you're a child. And like that literally influenced me to write a song. And I had no idea what I was doing, but I was, I wrote it and then I showed her and she's like, Oh my God, this is so cute. You know, it was like one of those moments and I was like, Oh my God, am I, am I okay at this? <laughs> so I guess she boosted my confidence in that a little bit, but, um, yeah, that's where like my artistic side really coming out. And I'll never forget the moment that I wanted to be in a band. It was like a summer school type of thing with um, these kids from high school that I had grown, I had grown up with. So I went to, to school with them. Um, we literally went to uh, summer school together. And on the way home from the summer school, they're like, let's start a band. And yeah, I was like, let's do it. It's just a crazy moment. Now, was it one of those things where everyone already played an instrument, but it was like, okay, you're going to learn this and you're going to learn that and that Dude, kind of thing? It's so funny because... It was really like, so we were watching like all these drive through records, you know, DVDs. I mean, I'm talking, I was probably like 13 years old. Um, we were watching all these drive through DVDs, all these crazy guys jump off the roofs and then playing in swimming pools, you know, like all punk. And we're like, let's start a band. We're like, yeah, let's do it. And I had already been taking singing lessons, right? So like, okay, Slate, so you're the singer. I was like, okay. Like, you're the drummer, Greg. Adam, you're the guitar player, and Mike, you're the guitar player. And they're like, okay, we need a bass player. And then we had a girl. We had a girl that was like a good friend of ours, and she already had played the bass. She was in like a punk band with a bunch of girls. So we stole her, and we formed our first band. <laughs> and what was? And I got to know what was the name of that band? Oh man, it was Troop One Hundred and One. So oh, so this was the this was the genesis of what became Ann Arbor. Yeah. So this was the very very beginning, man. So we we couldn't figure out a name, and we were eating a box of Girl Scout cookies, and there was like a troop something on the side. We're like, let's just make up a troop, you know, number at the end. So it was like, all right, we're Troop Two Hundred Two now, or Troop One Hundred One now, and that was uh, that was. The I, I'm not even going to ask if you guys dressed up as in a Girl Scout uniforms to perform. That would have been um, so much. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it, it was it was definitely brought up. I don't think we actually did it. You should see that the outfits at our first show. We, I think, probably one of us wore probably Girl Scout skirt. Skirt. So we were wild. It was it was a different okay. time. So that's great. So you guys, you, you, so you're 13. You know, you guys form this band, and then you yeah. actually become. I mean, it, it, walk me through like from just a bunch of kids, you know, screwing around, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but you know, oh, screwing yeah. around instruments and whatnot, to actually becoming a you know you know recording artist like with a label. Yeah, so, so basically, it was basically us going around. So we started in the garage. We didn't really know a couple of the people that – we didn't know one of the person Adam that had joined the band at the time. We didn't really know him, so we had to get to know him kind of in the garage hanging out. He was like more of a skater guy, but that was no problem. We actually got along really well and just started writing music. We didn't even have courses. We didn't have verses. We just started putting music together with our guitars in a garage. You know how you would normally write a song on an acoustic maybe? Nah, we were just like punk rocking it straight, just – drums okay that sounds good okay cool okay cool so like next three months we did some practice and we played our first show first show was at like a mesa skate land park and we didn't even get paid for it i mean it was like a it was like pizza box we got paid i think 20 bucks and we spent it on pizza and we sold the place out dude which was crazy because we were just coming out of, we were just in high school so all of our friends and all of our, you know, family members came because it was a big deal for them. But I think that was a moment for our parents to be like, oh my gosh, these kids are actually like bringing kids to the, to a show. We started gigging more just around the valley, like in Tempe and Phoenix and just playing, you know, local shows, local shows that would just get us anything that we could, um, any type of following, any type of fan base, because we were literally just kids screwing around. After we'd get out of school, we'd go play in the garage and then we'd be in me and a couple other kids would go to Taco Bell and throw burritos at people. Like we were just absolutely nuts. So once we started, you know, the band thing, we started to probably get a little bit, a little bit big headed just because, you know, we were all young, we were invincible and whatnot. People but, are paying attention to you and giving right, you the feedback and all that. Right, right. So we're like, Hey, let's, let's try to, you know, we didn't have a manager. We were just kind of doing whatever. We were like, let's try to, uh, you know, start playing in California. I think probably a year later after our first show, we uh, we started dipping out to like California, LA, like maybe San Francisco, just one-off shows that we could hit during the weekends, just so we could get out of school and maybe have like Monday off if we you know blew a flat tire or something. You know, it was like literally just kind of playing it by ear. I remember even driving up to like uh, I I can't even tell you like almost like I think it was Portland in a in a like a four wheeler for like a flatbed truck Jeez. and a trailer and like two of us rode in the back and like three of us squished up in the front it was craziness man it was so dangerous um but <laughs> like literally we would do anything to get to get to the show instead of you know just being a band 
so this happened for, I think, probably about another year or so. I mean, what? I think we were just just out of high school when Hopeless Records started like, hitting us up. And we, we had a couple record labels that were kind of coming out to see us at this point. And like, because we were starting bringing kids to California, like Anaheim. There was a club that we played there that was like our, basically our hometown called Chain Reaction. We played that almost every other month basically and we we are starting to sell the place out so we eventually started having people kind of were like oh this band's doing some cool stuff let's go check them out um eventually i think we we uh we decided to go with hopeless records and i think that's kind of how everything just got boosted to the next level for us um so let me jump into that just for a second you're you're, do, you're doing these shows now where the, where the where the different labels hopeless and the others that you mentioned yeah were they just there by virtue of that's what people at record companies do is they, they hang out at shows and wait to hear something that they like, or was there any outreach? Was there any, you know, proactive, I don't know, steps that you guys were taking to try to invite people to the shows, for instance, things like that, or, or is it, was it just sort of, you know, serendipity? Um, it was kind of more of like a hearsay thing. So like the more people were coming to our shows, the more people would be like, Hey, go check out this band. Cause you know, like the internet really wasn't like people had it, I think, but it wasn't like thriving like it is now, you know? Um, it wasn't as pervasive. It right? wasn't, yeah. Like it was more of like flyers, like like by like in paper, paper form. You know, it wasn't these like Instagram flyers for te- for shows. It was literally slap a flyer on, you know, the analog. Yeah, dude, it's, it was sick. But <laughs> um, it was kind of more of a hearsay thing. So people started, you know, hitting us up, and we had just like a local local guy here managing us. Well, local at the time, um, who was managing us, and then. You know, he he was like, "Hey, these guys are these people are hitting you guys up. They like you guys. They want to see what you guys are doing. They're watching you. So let's just keep playing these shows, uh, yada yada yada." You know, so we just kept playing shows, and maybe like on our on our breaks, like a spring break, we'd hit like a like a five day tour and like hit the hit the hit the West Coast, or like maybe go through Texas and come back just to get a little bit of more attention just from the U.S. You know that, that we could, and it worked. It worked. All right. So, you know, it's the, it's the, I don't want to say typical, but it's like, you know, that's, that, that is obviously what a lot of bands do. You, you, you write songs, you get together, you play and hit the road and you just rinse, wash, repeat until you kind of get a little traction. Yeah. Yeah. So, it, it worked out. Yeah. So uh, with the different, you don't necessarily need to name the other level labels or anything like that, but like, what was the, as you were looking at this attention and you were reviewing uh, whatever it was that uh, they were, they were telling you, what were you looking for and how did you, how did you make that decision uh, ultimately with hopeless? Um, so man, we were so, we were so young when we signed and here's the thing is there was no YouTube. There was no, you know, I don't even know if there was Apple music, there was no streaming. So when we signed the deal, we basically signed, you know, our, our, all of our streaming, not, not everything away, but it would be signed a 180 deal. So we signed, we had really no idea what we were doing. Um, our manager was very young. He really didn't. We had a couple of people look it over, but basically we didn't want to get screwed. Right. So we did hire a lawyer and the, basically what he told us was we should do a 180 deal. So do you, do you mean 360 or 180? 180. Yeah. Oh, so what's a 180 deal? So 180 heard of 360 deal, deals. 360 is when they take um, a cut of everything, right? Um, 180 is when they take everything except from touring. So they weren't taking any, any profit that we would take from touring rather than every other label that offered us was trying to give us a 360 deal and trying to take money. Uh, from every I see. Time. Yeah. And so our lawyer was like, yeah, they're giving you the best deal. So basically when we signed, they signed, we signed our video content away. I mean, we signed all that because no streaming, no, and none of that was out. Um, so it was a very unique, unique deal that we did with them, but we actually, it, it actually ended up being okay for us yeah because because, and, because of our career with them that they that they gave us so okay no that is interesting and you guys you guys were writing your own songs as well correct yeah oh yeah all original songs all original all right so you're so you're getting your you know your songwriting your publishing and things like that did, did you also yep. do a publishing deal was that part of the hopeless deal or did you uh, do no 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 way? publishing deal i've never never done a publishing deal oh so you're so okay so you get all your publishing then yeah Oh, that's really interesting. Okay. So we're going to come back to that in a second. Of yeah, no problem. Performing and things like this. But uh, okay, so you sign with Hopeless and what happens? Um, Everything so, explodes yeah. and you become world famous, right? Like, yeah, what no, I, I wish it was that easy. So basically, we signed to Hopeless. We had to talk to our, convince our parents that it was going to be okay. Because at the time, man, I was trying to juggle being in a band and playing soccer. I was like an awesome soccer player. I was captain of the team. I played club. I was traveling all the time. Jeez. And, um, yeah, I mean, I was trying to, trying to do it all. And at this point when we got signed, I kind of had to let my parents know and drop, drop, tell, you know, drop it and say, 
I want to do music. Music is what I love. You know, I'm, I'm kind of burnt out on the soccer thing. Um, and I had to tell my coach and it was like this whole ordeal. Um, but I'm glad that I did it. I'm really, really glad that I did it. Um, well, that's interesting. I mean, that's a, that's a quite a decision because you, now you've got three things here that I'm thinking of, right? You've got, yeah. you know, path A, which is what I'll call the traditional path. Go to school, go to college, get a right. job, you know, et cetera. Two, the sports thing, which is, you know, a risk of itself. There's not a whole lot of, you know, people that are, you know, are successful right. professional you know, sports players. And then three, the music thing, equally difficult, risky. Equal, oh, yeah. People, equally right? difficult. Yeah. So how are you weighing these things in terms of what you want to do? Um, well, I think, I think at that moment in my life, I had been playing soccer my almost like over half of my life. And I know that I knew that I was good because I was in, I was on the best team in Arizona. I just, I just couldn't see myself being happy if I turned the music option down. I, I just couldn't, I, I don't know I would be regretting it my entire life. I think like what could right. have been, what, what I could have done, what kind of songs I could have written. Cause I know that if I would have gone the soccer path, I know that I would have gone to school for it. And you know, I don't know. I could have either gone pro. I don't know if I would have been that good, but who knows? Who knows where my life would have gone, you know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. Uh, and I, I will, we'll get to the end here as we go through the interview, but I got to ask this up front. Uh, so far, no regrets? No regrets, man. No, no regrets. No, I mean, that it's been, it's been a bumpy road, but so far, I think right now in my life, I'm feeling, I'm feeling the love hard. So. All right. Well then just because we're kind of at that point of the interview, I got to ask, you know, let's talk about some of those bumps. Yeah. Um, you know, what was the, you know, what was the, you know, everything's cool. You're young, you're playing, you're signed, you know, right and high. And then, you know, tell me about when the first reality uh, part of that hit. So, I mean, the reality points start hitting when our first member quits. So, I mean, right, right after we got signed, we signed with Jess, the girl that I mentioned at the very beginning uh, in the band. She was the bass player. Mm -hmm. Well, when we got signed to Helpless Records, they basically threw us on tour. So right away, we were like, hey, guys, hey, mom, dad, we can't go to college right now. We got signed to a cool punk rock record label, and they want us to tour literally 300 days out of the year. Well, that's what they did. They threw us on, you know, we got a booking agent. They threw us on four or five tours in the year, and we just toured our asses off, man, in a van. Well, that second tour around the country in Florida, we had a member, which was Jess. She quit the band. She was our bass player, and she decided to go home. She just wanted to go to school. She figured out that maybe this wasn't her thing to do and at that point i was like huh you know not everybody's is as dedicated as i would think or i would like and that was kind of like a slap just kind of a reality check at that at that sure. point being that young you know i didn't really realize it was a reality check but it was um so the next day we had a show i had to learn the bass guitar i learned the bass i learned all of her parts and i decided to be the bass player and singer and that's when i became the singer and the bass player of ann arbor um was in after, right after that um and that was kind of just right after the moment where it's like shit you know i kind of taking it all on my back, kind of having to, to learn all these parts because nobody else is going to do it. We don't have anybody else on the tour that's going to help us. So that was the most kind of mo most... Uh, yeah, because the, uh, this is the same question that I just asked you earlier, which is those different paths to take. You know, it's yeah. not, you know some people might dip their toe in the path and realize it's not for them and, and, and move on. So that, that's a dynamic that you got to, I'm sure. Yeah, totally. Recognize, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, being on the road and traveling after, you know, so many tours and so many years of us doing this, there's always so many car accidents you've been in and everything that kind of makes you makes you kind of question what you're doing as your job, you know? Do you want to be traveling all the time in a van, in a bus, you know, that is, you know, the percentage of getting, the percentage of you getting in an accident is very, very high, especially when you're on the road so much. So it's, it's, a, it's a super dangerous, you know, super dangerous career path to choose. And my parents had always been super on top of it in my, in my life, which has been nice. Um, luckily we had never thought about the car accident part. How many have you, were you in many accidents? I mean, yeah, I've been in a bunch of, bunch of accidents, but we've hit black ice and spun around. We've hit a bunch of Jeez. signs. We've hit, we've hit cars. We've hit, I mean, we've had like four or five vans, man. So it's dangerous out there. <laughs> I, I just, I just hadn't thought of that as one of the. I'm always thinking like financial risks and whatnot. And oh, really of course. Well, that, well, of course. I mean, that was like I'm saying. I was like a high school kid, man. I was like financial was like not even a thing for me. It was more of like being safe and being a safe kid. Um, financially, we were making money as Ann Arbor, but we weren't taking care of the financials. Um, everything was what taken that care. Of. That was so. We saw the money that was coming in from the tours, and obviously, we were getting a cut. But everything from every everything else we really never saw anything of. 
So because you weren't just because someone else, I, I'm, uh, were you supposed to get it and you didn't, or you just weren't no, paying just attention because to it? Or? We just okay. weren't paying attention. Nobody, it was just kind of like, Hey, we're kind of just riding this out. And you know, it, it, how's this going to go? Is everybody, are we just going to all stay together? I mean, that's what eventually happened was the members quit in 2013. And that's when like things really kind of hit the fan for me. As a growing artist or songwriter, keeping royalties coming in is important for keeping the bills paid. It's also important to keep an eye on those royalty payments. A lot of people we worked with here at Royalty Exchange were having a tough time making sense of the royalties they were getting paid. So we built a free tool called Know Your Worth that automatically analyzes every royalty payment made on your music. It breaks it all down in an easy to understand analysis with some insights that would be impossible to find elsewhere. Plus, it connects you with the thousands of investors on Royalty Exchange and allows them to make you offers on your music. So far, musicians have raised over a million dollars for new projects, new ventures, and a whole lot of other things just through the Know Your Worth app. If you're earning royalties, you should be keeping track of them, and Know Your Worth makes it easy. It only takes about three minutes to connect an account, and the tool will automatically update over time. Just visit worth.royaltyexchange.com or find the link in the show notes to get started. Now, let's get back to the interview. We were starting to get a buzz um, in the U.S. and we were starting to do really well when we were drawing kids. I mean, this was like our third warp tour at this point. Um, so, I buy and and when I'm when I say like that, like we were touring a lot, but we weren't seeing a lot of money when it came down to it. There wasn't enough to make you know to, to to cut it. So that's why the other members had to had to leave the band just because we weren't making enough. Everything that we were making was going to hopeless unless we were on the road touring, and sometimes that's just not enough, you know. Okay. Yes, for sure. I totally that makes, get that. If that makes any sense, you know. It's yeah, like, and that, that's we're living. We're living with our parents, you know. Like we're traveling in the United States. We come home from a tour, and our parents are like, "Hey, where's the cash you got?" And we're like, "Yeah, we got a couple grand. You know, here's this, here's that." But there's nothing really to show for when it comes down to it, unless you really want to hit the road again and keep traveling. And you know, it's just it's just a vicious cycle until you really recoup everything. Right. What's so, the, how did you did, did you? <laughs> yeah, well, I was also, uh, no, and that's what we're going to get to, I guess, because this is about sort of the business side of it, basically. Right, so, did right. you did you uh, break out of that cycle? Did you look at things differently in terms of what are the different uh, ways that? Because I mean, there's so many different revenue streams that that artists have available to them. Not, they're not always necessarily, you know, uh, very big streams, but they're streams. So, like, yeah. you know, what did you what did you do? Um, so once they all quit, um, they quit right before Warp Tour. I decided to do Warp Tour because I felt like my managers convinced me that it would be a great idea and that right afterwards we were going to do an Australian, we did the Australian warp tour, which was great. Uh, financially not great. Um, as well as the warp tour that we did that year because it's no original members. So it was literally me with like a bunch of, you know, random people behind me because I had to pull everything together last minute. So that was kind of the downfall of Ann Arbor at that time. Uh, right, right around then I was like, yo, everybody quit. I need a break. I've been doing this for too long. At least I thought, <laughs> Um, and I thought I needed a break. So I took a break and I took a couple years off, maybe did a couple other projects here and there. I was some people here in Arizona. Um, but then I decided to bring everything back in, I think, 2015, um, which was a, which at that point, that year, we had recoup with Hopeless Records. Um, so that's when everything for me was like game changing. I started seeing money from the streaming because the contract that we signed with him had to recoup with when we had paid everything back to it, um, hopeless records. So finally I had started seeing some, you know, some money from the music that I had made for the past, you know, 10 years or so. Um, it was great. That was like the big, big pivotal moment for me. And so how are you, when you're looking at these things, we talked about touring, obviously now you're talking about seeing the money from streaming after being recouped, but then we mentioned publishing earlier. Was that, was that even a factor? Was that, was that helping or like, so the like, you know, break that down? So yeah, I, I wasn't seeing any money from the publishing until we could recoup with Hopeless. And at that time I tried to maybe sell a couple of the publishing, the publishing money, but it was just too late at that point. Nobody wanted to, nobody really wanted to be a part of it. And that's, you know, 
I could, that was, that's why we love royalty exchange so much. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. I wasn't going there, but sure. I'll take the compliment. <laughs> well, yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's honestly, yeah, absolutely. That's definitely like, it was like a game changer for me and for, a bunch so of had you not, let me, I mean, so you, you, b- before you were recouped, you weren't really seeing anything, any, any publishing probably I'm guessing. And t- tell me if I'm wrong. Is, is that because you didn't have uh you didn't do a publishing deal to kind of, right. I guess I, I, that part of it. Had you not registered with the PRO or anything like that? Yeah, yeah. We guess we just didn't register, and Hopeless didn't really oh. explain much to us. So they just kind of maybe took advantage of that aspect and ran with it until you know we had some people kind of look at our contract and like, hey, you guys are recouped. Where's the money that you're not seeing? And it was like, okay, because I had I okay. had so many people come to me and say, you know what, you should be making money. Where's the money? Because you guys we have you know forty eight million streams a year. Like this is crazy. So. Yeah, and particularly, like I said, even on, and on that on that you know the PRO the publishing side, it's like the label would would collect the mechanical from the publisher to pass along, but like the the PRO stuff, that's usually something you got to do directly, or you just won't see it. Or even like you know the digital performance royalty from Sound Exchange and things like that. There's so many artists that don't do that. It's it's always interesting to see. Um, yeah, we just didn't know. We didn't know yeah. anything about that, man. We were like I said, we were young little babies thrown into this. <laughs> thrown into the wolves basically you know in the business side at least <laughs> right well totally i mean and, and it's complicated i mean dude it's a savage business dude i'm it's, i it's, still can't even like i still get blown away at the moves that people are still making to me and to people around me and it's just man it's vicious so the the podcast name is you know uh, the big break right and so yeah, I, yeah. I guess what i'm wondering is that you know at the we could kind of look at the signing with hopeless as as really the big break because that was sort of what everyone points to right they got the record right, deal, they right, went right. On tour and this and that let me ask you do you feel that was the your big break as an artist or do you or was there a different big break or do you think your big break is still to come um well that's a that's a great question so i think that it depends on when you ask me that question. So if you would have asked me in that question back when I signed to Hopeless, I would have been, I would have said, absolutely, this is awesome. Um, I can't wait for the future. It's going to be great. Um, now, here I am, a 30-year-old 30 30 year man. Um, I think when I started recouping from Hopeless was my big break because that's when I started seeing money, and that's when I could start putting money into my music independently and seeing the stream numbers that nobody else could take from me. So let's let's talk about that. That's, like that's my very big, interesting. That's my big break right there. Honestly. Yeah. So At like, what have now. you been doing? How, 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 talk, talk to others out there that maybe aren't doing this. Like, what what? I mean, I don't need it to be like step by step if you don't have it in your head right now. But like, yeah, no, no. just generally, like someone you know, they sign, they're making money, they think everything's fine. You know, what are some of the things that you're looking at now that you hadn't even thought of? You know, before that's that's really meaningful. I mean, I, I, like having to. Having to find a producer from home that you may maybe want want to play with. I mean, it just there's just so many other there's so many things. It's hard to do this by yourself, but there's just so many things that I have control of now. So, I like what, so like control control that's that's the key there. Having control, having control of everything. Hopeless Records did everything for us, which was great. But then again, I didn't know the questions to ask, and I didn't know what was happening at the time you know, while we were on the road, while we were doing all these shows, while, while everything was going on, I, I didn't know really what was, what was going on. So now that I have control, I can control where I put the money. I can control who does our, our EP. I can control who wants to do our record, who does our artwork. I can control where we want to play. I can literally control everything. I'm my own manager now, which is amazing. And do you like doing that? I do. Um, like I said, it's a lot. It's a lot of work, and I'm 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 my own manager, but I also have a couple of people that work for me and that help the band. Um, it's a lot of work, and if you don't have you know the connections, and if you don't have the platform that Hopeless gave us, then it's very hard. So, okay. Hopeless Records gave us the platform to be able to do this, which I'm so thankful. And I tell everybody that I know, and then ask me questions that if I I wouldn't be here without Hopeless Records, no no doubt in my mind. Um, but we yeah, were, but having that control, it's really interesting because it's like it's harder. It's it's not the rock and roll lifestyle talking about like you know. No man, you're basically <laughs> you know, checking you're, your publishing splits and such. But like, no, you're your own it's, boss. It's, yeah, it's like yeah. you wake up. I got to you know run all of our social media. I got to take care of all the streaming. We have to keep everything interesting. So all these tracks that we're doing for these kids for live stream, we just got to be really on it. You know, and I love it. It keeps me busy, and it, it, I I get to be more interactive with the fans, which, which is great. This is what I love. Yeah. So let me ask about that. I mean, that does does having having that control. See, control to me also means you have more awareness, right? Like you understand things Correct. that you may not have paid totally. attention before, and that can lead to a whole nother 
thing. Like, like you say, like, you know, understanding maybe from a business standpoint, the types of steps you need to take that can lead to a more creative uh, enjoyment, which is like what you're saying, keeping, keeping connected with the fans and things like that. Yeah, man. It's, it's, it's awesome to see. It's awesome to be this close to the fans. When we, when we were with hopeless, it was like kind of the more mysterious, like, Oh yeah, we'll do this for you guys. We'll, we'll put this out. We'll have signed, signed 10 of these and we'll send these out. You know, now it's like, Hey, hit me up. I'll, I'll put you a, I'll put a personal message on this, you know, vinyl and I'll send it out to you because you don't have to go through anybody else except me, you know? And yesterday we jumped on the streaming service. Uh, it was Twitch and we had this girl from Brazil that jumped on. We had like a little interview with her and she was great. You know, we just, it's crazy how this, all this, this social media is just like getting so much closer to the fans and to, to the artists, it's just connecting that cool. gap, you know? So let me ask you a couple of other uh, questions about all this then. I guess, first of all, kind of re- related to the control part, you're in, um, you're in Phoenix, right? Yeah. Phoenix, uh, downtown. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know what the, in, what the music industry infrastructure there is. I'm in Denver. There's not a whole lot. I mean, there's some, but not a whole lot, but it's not the typical Nashville, New York, you know, LA kind of, kind of thing. Is that, is that a challenge? Does it help? Can I talk about trying to have that level of control without this, the typical infrastructure that you might get from, you know, some of the more foundational uh, locations? Right. So um, it's hard. Uh, back in the day when we first started Ann Arbor, it was much easier. Like with the, the flying, the kids from school, everybody would come to your shows. I feel like now everybody is just maybe so particular. There's a lot of music nowadays. So people can go to the shows, they can pick and choose. Back in the day, the promoters, the certain way they would promote the shows, the bands that they had on. I mean, dude, we were playing like sold out shows to like 700 kids when I was still in high school and it was a local show. Like, I don't even know how they were doing that now. I mean, compared to nowadays, it's like, it's all, it's all social media. I think, I think everything is so social media driven that if it's like a business card, if your social media doesn't look good, then you're, it kind of comes off that you're not legit. So maybe you don't get that show or maybe that, that band doesn't want you to play this show because your social media card isn't good. It's just, it's a crazy game now. (laughs) Yeah. And that kind of even leads to the whole part. Like, you know, you got your start as a band by just going out and touring, touring, touring clearly right now, uh, at least for the foreseeable, you know, so hopefully short term future, that's not, that's not possible. Do you, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if that's the way to do things anymore. Honestly, that's, that's what I'm getting at. Yeah. I'm not sure. I'll be honest. I'm not sure that, you know, really hitting the, hitting it hard and touring 30, 30 cities in a month is the way to tour anymore because all the social media and especially now that all of this quarantine is going on bands or people are working from home. Bands are having to figure out how to make money and, you know, without touring, which is huge. That's a huge, huge revenue cut right now for all these artists that aren't touring anymore. So we're all kind of adapting. I mean, I'm still trying to figure out this whole streaming stuff too. I'm, I'm bummed. <laughs> I didn't, I'm bummed. I didn't get on Twitch earlier. <laughs> That's Twitter interesting. Yeah. That stuff, you know? Yeah. No, I have a, a someone I know from the business from before. She's big on uh, helping musicians on Twitch and things like that. We can we can chat about that later if you like. But yeah, that'd be great. Um, so, and let me ask another thing. Now, uh, performing versus songwriting. Sure. Do you have a preference? Well, or just maybe just talk about the differences between those things a little yeah. bit. Yeah. So I've changed my songwriting process. I think a lot since I've grown. Um, back in the day. Um, when I had just my guitar and me and my, my girlfriend that broke up with me, you know, I was writing like songs on the guitar and yeah, it would take me like a whole half a year to write a song because I would have the ideas and write them in my journal and try to write it. You know, nowadays I would rather not even take notes of what I'm thinking of on my spare time because I love writing music on the fly and I love writing music within like as, as fast as I can, as good as it can be. I mean, this brings me into a whole nother project that I started last year, but uh, me and this producer started this project that's on YouTube called Watch Rudy. And basically we, we did a song in a day and then we put the song on streaming services so you can listen to it and you can see how we wrote the song all in one day. I know that might seem a little crazy, but it's actually, it's actually a really, really cool project. And all the songs, they're, they're all actually really good. They could all be Ann Arbor songs. They could all be anybody you know, any of my other project songs, there's no difference. It's just the songwriting. It's just the song writing difference. That's really it. The way you take the approach to write the song. Some people can write a song in, you know, an hour. Some people just takes six months. It just depends. I think, I think for now, right, right now, I like songwriting better than I like playing live. So that's probably good timing 
given yeah. the fact that you're not going to be playing live for a little while. Yeah, <laughs> anyway. right. and, I mean, we plan on going to the studio in June, and I talked to Danny, my other guitar player. I don't want – I want to go in as a blank slate. I want to write the record while we're in the studio, and I don't want to have oh. any other ideas out of, out of that, you know, because – because when I write on the fly, I feel like I come up with like some great ideas. And when I'm in my car listening, I'm like, oh, I forgot that. It's like, I don't even want to think about it unless I'm in the job doing it, you know? That's so funny. I mean, and that, and that is, the, the, I've heard that a lot with other songwriters and that sometimes it does happen. Other times, you know, there are those songs that take years to write. I mean, yeah, it's just I listened to, no, I, yeah, there was a, there was a great podcast episode uh, by Malcolm Gladwell that looked at these different songs that he looked at the song, you know, Hallelujah, right? The Leonard Cohen song that was made, mm -hmm. you know, more popular by uh, Buckley. And, uh, but it was like, it wasn't until Buckley's interpretation of the song really fully kind of had its moment yeah but it was like years yeah yeah, <laughs> you know yeah I mean? exactly exactly yeah just so take it's that guy to cover it. It. yeah it's, it's that's it's there's no right or wrong way man honestly now and like i said who knows there might be a kid right now in a basement making a song and then tomorrow he's going to put it out and it's going to go viral just like little nas x you know you never you never know right but it's also there's also that's the creative kind of component of it, which I'm much less qualified to speak to but there's also like we kind of talked about a little bit earlier there, there there's also the business component of owning, you know, you, you own the royalty of the song itself, not just the recording of the song, right? You know, having that, that publishing revenue stream at a time like this um, is particularly important because there's, that continues to earn even if you're not on stage. Exactly. Exactly. So now that people are at home, maybe the streaming's up or down, doesn't matter because people are still listening to music. You know, you can't, tack, you can't really take that away. It's great. Exactly. So let's see here. Um, so what's next? I mean, I, I know that right now you're holed up and whatnot, but you had mentioned you, you guys were talking, you did a couple of things you mentioned. You mentioned maybe going on a European tour at some point, if this is ever to uh, to sort of loosen up. And you also mentioned going into the studio. So can you yeah. kind of just tell me, and, and maybe if you could, as you're doing that, the last time, as we were going through your history, uh, I just knew that the band quit and you were on your own. So I don't know how you built, rebuilt it. I'd love to kind of hear a little bit of that too. Yeah, yeah, no, no problem. Um, so let's start there. So basically, everybody quit. I took the year off. Um, I decided to start a band with a bunch of other people that were from Phoenix. Um, one guy was in a band called Lydia. I don't know. It was just kind of like a like a a local supergroup. We did a couple EPs that kind of went down. It was great, but we didn't really go anywhere with it. We played in LA for a little bit. Um, we released everything on streaming, but that took a couple of years of my life. After that, I realized that I had recouped from, from Hopeless. So I had a little bit of cash to do another record. Um, and I had a friend that was like, hey, let me help you. Let me, um, let me see what I can do as like a day-to-day -day type of manager type of thing. So we talked to a band called Emerosa, who was another band that had just uh, recently signed to Hopeless Records. And they decided to take us out at the drop of the record. So that's what we did. That was kind of just like the boost of the record that we put out, uh, that I got to put out, that I paid for, you know, that I picked the artwork for, that I got to literally do everything for, which was great. It's a great feeling. Um, once that happened, we got back and we had a little bit of downtime. We decided to get a drummer because we lost our drummer. I mean, I, I only had three members. I had one member come back within that two year change out. And then I had another member join. So it was just three people at that moment without a drummer. Um, we had a kid that was from Phoenix. He was 17 years old. He was literally a prodigy. This guy was insanely good. Um, we played it, one show with him at the marquee, sold it out. It was great. Um, but he unfortunately took his life um, like six months within joining the band. So sorry. No, it's, I mean, it's, it's life, but the kid was 17 years old and I'm telling you, this kid was a, he was a prodigy. He was crazy. So after that happened, that put us, you know, behind again, because we were, we just kept, you know, it felt like, I feel like at this point I've just been like hitting bump after bump after bump. And I've just been like, man, you know, I just did this record. We just lost a drummer. Everybody was kind of down on the dumps. We picked up a new manager, the manager kind of almost, if I can say he almost ship shipwrecked us with with some money that we had coming in and the money where he put the money to um, PR people. I feel like I almost got scammed when it came to this, this whole idea, which yeah. was, which was a bummer. Um, so we took the, we took another, you know, year, a year and a half off. And um, that kind of led us to now. So now I've kind of saved up a little bit of money and I'm kind of ready to get back at it. Um, so basically what we have been doing for the past three months is we've been making an EP. The EP is going to come out on May 1st. Um, and it's just a three song, you know, a little, little giddy to get us back in it. And then we're going to go into the studio in, in June to do a full length record.
uh, that I get to pay for, that we get to put on ourselves, and we get to pick all the artwork and everything else for. Uh, when it comes to touring and playing shows, I I'm I do not think I can get you know in a bus or in a van or whatever they want to put me in and travel you know another thirty. 30 days around the United States. I think that we are going to play it out after this whole coronavirus thing and see, you know, how the quarantine goes and how people are taking big crowds after this whole experience. You know, I'm not really sure how everything's even going to go when bands like, or people like Justin Bieber come through, you know, are people going to want to be in big, big, you know, arenas with lots of people? I don't know. So we're going to play out the streaming thing and see how it goes. Um, We do plan to hit uh, overseas in February. I think since everything got canceled, um, and I'm having another another baby here that's due in uh, September. So I put everything back to February. So I think we're going to see how everything goes. We may not even go to the UK, honestly, depending on how everything goes. But it's all getting set up now. So that's that's going to be the next tour that we do. It won't be anything in the U.S. Um, we're going to kind of keep it, keep it, uh, yeah, exclusive yeah. for the U.K. and yeah. Right on. Okay. Well, that sounds interesting. I mean, you've, you've, there's a, a number of, um, I mean, I, I don't want to say that the coronavirus is like sort of played into your hand of not wanting to tour as much, but it's, 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 it's probably good yeah. that you're already thinking that way. Right. Dude, I was, I was totally already thinking that. And, you know, we have a booking agent that is always hitting us up like, Hey guys, Hey guys, we need to book something. Hey guys. And I'm like, yeah, but I think, I think we need to release music. We need to have some, I'm not going to jump in a van and tour for no reason and headline for no reason. You know, I want something to be there for. And if we do, then, you know, we'll schedule a show in Phoenix and we'll schedule a show in LA and we'll schedule a show in San Francisco and I'll, we'll fly out and play one-offs and that'll, that's no problem, but I'm not going to, you know, drive and waste this precious time that I have that we don't really need to waste anymore. Unless you're a huge artist, you know, unless you're a massive artist that has to tour because you know, the demand. Right. And, and and you are still looking at these platforms you mentioned Twitch. I don't know if there's anything else that you're Yeah, Twitch, Facebook, um, Instagram, you know, we were we went live on all those yesterday and it was it was great. You know, we had a great a great uh, great fan reaction and everybody seemed to really like it. So we're going to do that every Thursday now and just kind of roll right. with it. Yeah. Well, and ironically, as we were talking, I saw uh, I got a note to to take the the last edit of your listing that you will we'll be having soon on Realty Exchange as well. I'm not going to get into that. This is about you, not us. But yeah, um, no I just think it's kind of funny that you got you just you got a lot of you got a lot of irons in the fire at the moment. So I think that's probably a good place to be right now. Yeah, man. I'm just trying to you know get everything back on and just you know trying to trying to get put the money in to get a little bit more out. You know, and that's this is the way to do it. And I'm super I'm super grateful for War at the Exchange, and you guys have helped me a right. lot. So, so awesome. we we look we look forward to seeing how it goes. But listen, um, I, that's really all I had for you. Is there anything else you want to um, uh, add, point out, promote, recommend, advise? Um, you know, I I think I might have missed the like the whole you and I. We had like a Scooby Doo thing on Cartoon Network that was like pretty. That's sick. right. And yeah. I, I don't know if you want to talk about that at all. I mean, I don't. Sure. I don't really. We don't have to. It's like my least. But no, I'm curious about that because I, I remember that from the listing now that you guys had a. That was the made for TV uh, Scooby Doo show, and you had a. Oh, I forgot the name of the song. Yeah, you and I, and honestly, that was that was a huge part of us as well. That Hopeless helped us out with, and I don't think they even had a point in it. I think Cartoon Network, like they said, came to Hopeless and was like, "We want a band for this, you know, this movie." What, which one you got? And they're like, well, we have these. And they picked us. And then we went into the, you know, the Cartoon Network studio. They checked us out. And they like, picked out a wardrobe. And then, you know, a couple of weeks later, we were in this warehouse filming. You know, people are making breakfast. There's a whole makeup crew. And, you know, I'm in the van smoking weed or whatever, you know. Like, not, <laughs> no, like just not even really get, not realizing what's happening, you know. It's just like we were just such babies. But that was really, really good for us. It, it didn't go to theaters. It went to uh, VHS. But it's still, that song is still a fan favorite for some reason <laughs> and and so no you actually appeared in the, so it wasn't just like this took the song and licensed it and put it in, the, in you know like a same so, kind of thing it was it was actually you guys performing in the in the film itself uh so no we weren't actually in the film they asked us to okay. do an original song um for the movie and then to cover a song that simple plan had done before ah. it was called what's new scooby-doo they did it for the movie before and then we just covered it as like our i movie. see so okay that was just because you mentioned the makeup and all that and i was trying to get a sense of how that worked yeah, dude. So at the at the literally the video shoot, I mean, they like they sat us down, they put a bunch of airbrush makeup on, and then we all had our parts, and like it was only for the music video. But I yeah. see that was okay. I got confused. Yeah, only, okay, yeah I'm it. sorry. Okay, yeah, cool. maybe I didn't explain that very well. Yeah. No, 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 it's fine. Um, but uh, so yeah, that that is interesting. Now, did that? What did that actually do for you guys, though? I mean, I mean, other than it being a cool experience, and um, you know, did it give you more exposure? Did it? Did it? 
was it a big pop in in terms of you know streaming revenue? I think, things I like think that? it was a big pop for the streaming revenue on the and and the video. I mean, on you know YouTube and stuff for Hopeless, we didn't really see much from it, rather than people coming to our shows and saying, "Hey, uh, you know, I heard your song on Scooby Doo. I liked your song on Scooby Doo." You know, that's that's really all we saw. I, I don't think I've even seen the movie to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I mean, I, I'm sure now that I, my two year old, I need to show her the movie, but I, I don't think I've I think you absolutely have to show her the movie. I'm I mean, not ready I, for it. <laughs> You need to. Come on. Like, like you, know, you don't have any right. very. I, I'm a parent myself. You don't have a lot of chances to show your kid that you're actually cool. I don't care who you are. You're right. You're, 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 you're just dad <laughs> until, you, until you're on TV. That's right. That's right. You're funny. <laughs> That's awesome. No, well, that is pretty cool. Um, so you know, definitely try to you know ramp up the spins on that a little bit and get you know get you. Yeah, yeah and like I mean, that's still that's still one of our most streamed songs. So regardless, if I want to say it didn't help us, it definitely helped us because. They, I mean, it's the, the proof's in the pudding right there. So so seeking out those kinds of opportunities. I mean, I think that that's something that's become a lot more accepted today. There was a time when people were less interested in doing those kinds of things. And, yeah. and that's that's kind of, a, I think, an almost dead attitude, uh, it, it feels like. Um, yeah. Like like the exposure you get from, like, again, it's all about, it's an attention economy now, right? Oh, it's yeah. not about, oh, they're selling out because they're doing this thing with the show. It's like, no, you need to be heard. Yeah. And, and these are the channels through which you can be heard. Yep, yep. So they just basically came to us. It kind of just fell onto our lap. We didn't, it was just us being signed to Hopeless. I think that's how the entire thing even happened. So cool. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I think that if there's any lesson that I, uh, in talking to you and pulling out from all of this stuff is that, you know, um, that the big break for you was, was, uh, regaining control, right? You know, not just, not just gaining the royalty streams that you, that were, uh, redirected to the recoupment, you know, clause of the contract, but like not only getting that revenue stream, but also regaining the control of how you're going to continue that revenue stream. Right. It feels to me like that was sort of the big takeaway that I'm getting from you. Uh, 100% percent, man. 100%. That was that at this point in my life. I mean, I'm still an artist. I'm still putting out music, but right now that's, that was my biggest break, I think. All right, cool. Well, listen, man, thank you very much. Good luck to you. Stay safe and healthy. And uh, please, uh, uh, I'm going to be very curious to see how you guys progress. I'll be keeping an eye on you. Yeah, man. Thank you so much for having me. I love this. It was awesome. You guys All right, great. Good. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. To keep up with Slade and Ann Arbor, check out their social profiles linked in the show notes. We'll be back in two weeks with another brand new episode. Until then, stay safe, and we'll see you next time.